Okay, uh, it's nice to be here this morning and uh, I really, as an emeritus, enjoy this seminar format. Uh, I think the best ideas emerge if you can sit around a table and have ideas. So I wanted to thank uh, the new school, specifically the Institute of Philosophy and the New Humanities and uh, my two colleagues, Paul Cotman and Jeff Feld, uh, with whom we have had a very particularly friendly email correspondence over a whole year. So <laughs> building up for uh, this morning, uh, my wife was saying this morning when I left the hotel, so you must really be looking forward to that after so much email. And I was really <laughs> looking forward to that. So I wanted to thank you for uh, inviting me to this lecture series that seems to be important. I mean, the topic really matters, which one cannot say about all lecture series in the humanities, I say, as an emeritus in retrospective. Um, I have to say, as a German-born American citizen, and I'm proud to be an American citizen, I cannot read or listen to the name of the new school without being both grateful and proud, grateful as a German-born and proud as an American citizen for what this institution did for German emigrants, but emigrants doesn't sound right, for German intellectuals who had to escape Germany in the 1930s and the 1940s. I mean, this is not all that the new school has achieved by far, but I cannot be at this place and I cannot be at this institution, being German born of my generation, uh, without remembering that. And maybe every speaker has mentioned it, but it does matter and it does matter to the young generation. But I think it's also in order to thank the Udo Keller Stiftung and my dear friend Kai Werntgen. If I mention too many dear friends, you know why I got invited, because I have, <laughs> I have many friends for this invitation. And also my friend and sometimes intellectual opponent that makes the friendship, uh, Marcus Gabriel, for the opportunity to be here this morning. Now, if I'm asking myself, what could have the idea to invite a 73-year-old emeritus, and I stop talking about emeritus, to a lecture series that really concerns the future of the humanities? I mean, this is what this is all about. A polemic comes to mind that Marcus and I had about exactly to the week a year ago in what we both consider to be the best daily newspaper in German language, the point being that this is the Swiss Neue Zürcher Zeitung. Uh, where I, a little bit more than a year ago, had kicked off a debate about the humanities, the public function of the humanities today, with the thesis, I was actually quite serious about that, Marcus, and think about it whether you agree or not, with the thesis of saying that if the humanities tomorrow stopped existing, for whichever reason, nobody outside the humanities would notice that and would miss them. This is what I was saying, and I thought this was quite reasonable. But less than two weeks later, there was a really engaged and strong counterstatement by my friend Markus in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung. He had not told me about it, so he was really serious about it, saying, and I'm quoting him, that it was a gigantic mistake to make statements like my statement. And it was very clear that he was referring to me and to my article. So this is being good polemics between friends, a gigantic mistake because, and I'm quoting again, Marcus said, only the humanities, only the Geisteswissenschaften, have the capacity today to analyze objectively, and the word objectively appeared, objective, to analyze objectively the overcomplex political, social, economic, epistemological challenges that humankind is confronted with today. So he's making this very, very strong statement that only the humanities, only the Geisteswissenschaften, and it sounds even more astonishing, sciences of the spirit, are capable of analyzing the situation. And clearly, the way I know my friend Marcus and the way this, this essay, this newspaper essay was written, the word objectivity came with an implication of pertinence. Pertinence in the sense of a German word that we both like, uh, remember our first encounter in Bonn, Verbindlichkeit. Meaning that objectivity also had a truth claim with a practical purpose of orientation. Yeah? This was not just okay, you know, like sometimes in analytic philosophy, we can all agree on that, or it's true, no, there was a political claim in that. 
Now, if I understand Marcus's new philosophical realism correctly, and it matters to me to understand it because it matters to me uh, to use it in the sense that there is no overarching extended reality, but only as he calls them dimensions of meaning, dimensions of sense within which we can achieve objectivity, then this truth claim, I mean objectivity claim, he made on behalf of the humanities, I don't know whether you agree, but that's my first polemical statement, was rather a truth claim for philosophy within humanities. Yeah? For philosophy as that dimension that Marcus describes, the dimension of universal reason. But I think, Marcus, it was not, it could not be a truth came for the humanities, for the Geisteswissenschaften at large. This is not a criticism. This was well-placed polemics, and we got a lot of attention, so you did well. But the point I want to make, and the point that your reaction to my essay triggered in me was, should we and can we discuss the humanities at large? Or are the humanities not, according to your philosophy, one of those overextended worldviews um, that we should not address as such. Should we not rather address, I mean, I don't like to talk about philosophy as a discipline, but should we not rather address philosophy as a dimension or history of a dimension? I mean, you had a discussion about that yesterday with Jill Lepore, I, I imagine, or literary studies as a dimension. So in this sense, and thinking about what I could contribute to this colloquium here, I did something that I have hardly ever done within my own academic career. I think in a very typically German way, I was always a little bit um, embarrassed to be only a professor of literature, not of philosophy. And I've always pretended that I can also do philosophy and that philosophy, after all, is the core, the organ of the humanities. No, I was thinking, what would be the dimension of literary studies within the humanities? And this is really what I want to try to develop this morning in the context, in the larger context of the humanities, in the larger context of the Geisteswissenschaften. What could be, if there's any possibility, an objectivity claim for literary studies? An objectivity claim for literary studies, partly because I think to ask this question more specifically will also oblige us to think about the relationship between the specific dimensions within the humanities, plural, and humanities at large, singular. Right? Grammatical plural, but, but singular semantically. Now, my first impression was that if you do that, you have a strange situation of polarity within literary studies, not of bipolarity, because that in American English can only be understood in a psychiatric way that may also be typical for literary studies, that you're maniac depressive, but I mean polarity. Polarity in that sense that within this dimension of literary studies, you always have on the one side um, interpretation. You have on the one side a tendency within the interpretation towards plurality, you know, the different ways of interpreting a text, the different ways of interpreting an artwork, but on the other side, and this is hardly ever mentioned, you have philology. You have the contact with the materiality of the text, or in art history with the materiality of the artwork, or in musicology with the materiality of music. Yeah? I mean, I think there is an equivalent to philology uh, within musicology, not something I, I can engage with because I don't know enough music in that sense. But, but yes, I mean, there are these equivalents of the material contact of the work of the human spirit in art history, in um, uh, uh, musicology, the equivalent to philology in literary studies. Now, I think that this polarity between interpretation and hermeneutics, but I will not use interpretation and hermeneutics synonymously, I will come back to that, between this interpretation pole and the philological pole has a quite interesting affinity with a basic philosophy of phenomenology in the sense that whenever we have an intentional object, and for the students among you, but there are a few undergraduate students, intentional object by intentional object, Husserl meant I mean 
a perception that becomes an object in your mind. Whenever you have an intentional object, you cannot help reacting to it in two ways. You cannot help tentando atribuir um, um significado. Huh? I mean, you cannot help trying to, to attribute a meaning. I was saying three words in Brazilian Portuguese because this is one of the many things that, that, that Marcus and I share, that for the same reasons, historically, biographically, we love Portuguese. But even if you don't understand Portuguese, Brazilian or continental, you, you cannot help trying to attribute meaning. Yeah? I mean, for example, the concierge in the hotel where we're staying here speaks a kind of Arabic that I have no way of understanding, and still I try to listen to him. You cannot help doing that. Or when I'm teaching at the Hebrew University, I cannot speak Hebrew, but, but I try to listen to it. But at the same time, and we hardly ever mention that, even if I close my eyes and Marcus reacts, or Kai reacts, or one of you reacts, I cannot help establishing a relationship between my body and the intentional object. Yeah? I cannot help establishing that. That's what I have called in a book published too many moons ago, presence. Presence in the etymological sense of pre as a being front of. Yeah? So that's presence. So the, the affinity between meaning attribution and the presence relationship has to do, I think, with this polarity within literary studies, and perhaps not only within literary studies, between interpretation on the one hand and philology on the other. Is that clear so far? Well, then I can actually stop the lecture. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, in order to fill the time that uh, was assigned, I want to say that in a historical view, history of the humanities, and it's very difficult to say when the humanities as Geisteswissenschaften were beginning. It is relatively easy, as I will show you, to say when literary studies started institutionally. But what you can see historically is that the interpretative pole, the meaning attribution pole, always has a tendency towards plurality, towards complexity, as I'm calling it in the title of my talk. And that means that the humanities have always tried to bind it back to objectivity, to find a way to get this plurality, that explosive plurality, back to objectivity. I think that's part of the history of the humanities, really. Whereas, on the other hand, on the philological side, which I find in a way more interesting, you have an objectivity that is clearly not the objectivity of philosophy as universal reason. It's a different objectivity. It is a material objectivity. It is an objectivity, as I will try to show, that has to do with what we call aesthetics. It has very little to do with reflections on aesthetics, but it has to do with this perceptual relationship to the world. It has to do with what in another book that I shouldn't have published I call the powers of philology. Mm. The powers of philology in the sense that this material contact to the object of consideration triggers, provokes a physical investment. Yeah, I was arguing, I was describing when as a philologist you see the fragment of a text. I started out as a medievalist. You have a feeling like this is a wound. You have to heal this text. I mean, this is very metaphorical. Nevertheless, that's the first impulse. Or if you are editing a text, my first work in my profession was editing a late medieval Spanish text, the Libro de Buen Amor. Do a new edition of that. You cannot help projecting yourself physically in the role of the one who wrote the words on the parchment. Or if you write a commentary, I have this, I like commentaries. I mean, this Gratian book, I wrote a commentary. You want to be exuberant. You want to fill up the margins till they burst. You get my point. Philology comes with this investment, with these powers of philology. Now, after this super long introduction or first part, of a lecture. In that, I have remained very, very German. Uh, I have two parts left for the lecture this morning, and I hope uh, they will entertain you. The second part will be a completely irresponsible quick step through the history of humanities and literary studies to show how this polarity is building up, Yeah, how you have this explosive side of interpretation trying to bind it back, and how you have variations uh, of that philological, of that present side. That will be the main part of the lecture, completely irresponsible, because you know, if I had to still qualify, I wouldn't dare to talk about the history of humanities and literary studies in half an hour. And in the final part, logically, 
based on a very brief analysis of our present intellectual situation, late October 2021, I will of course try to say what we can possibly do with these objectivities within literary studies and within the humanities. Now, I mean, if you didn't look like me, like you were interested, which is very kind, I could say that from now on my talk will last another 40 minutes. Uh, but the problem is if you look at me like you're interested, I can easily get very chatty and the talk can get longer. If you'd rather look like me, like German academic audiences, I get embarrassed uh, and I shortcut and it gets shorter. I mean, however long or short it takes, the responsibility is uh, completely yours. Yeah. And I think it is, right? Yeah. But I cannot see really whether you, you, you shake your hand, your, your head in approval or not, because you have the mask on, so it's even more hermeneutically difficult. Anyway, the quick step. Uh, just this is an interesting problem having to do with the history of the humanities. It's very difficult to say when the humanities at large start. We can certainly say that reflection about what the humanities should be started uh, in the late 19th century, both in France, Dürer came to, to a borderline between the social sciences, science, science sociale and science humaine, and in Germany, of course, Diltai, etc., etc. But when they actually started as a discipline is difficult to say. But, and this is my first step, you could certainly say as a historical condition of the possibility of the humanities to emerge, you needed epistemologically the transition from medieval culture to early modern culture. So I will briefly say what this is all about in, in, in three aspects, just as an, as an introductory clause, as the first of six steps. I mean, firstly and obviously, the predominant human self-reference. I mean, how did humans think about themselves? In the Middle Ages, this was the self-reference of Genesis. I mean, God formed the form of a human out of dirt. For a German, this is always strange that you say in English, out of dirt. Aus Schmutz. No, of course, not aus Schmutz. Aus Erde. And then he was breathing the pneuma into him. So this is body and spirit. Whereas, of course, obviously, and we don't have to derive that philosophically, the predominant early modern self-reference, why this happened is a different question, is the one that Descartes, in the most genius way, in the most compact way, formulated as, it, as cogito ergo sum. And we sometimes underestimate that cogito ergo sum means the ontology of human existence is consciousness, is the spirit is the mind. There's nothing left. Everything else is not human. This is quite dramatic. Yeah. And we tend to underestimate that. Second aspect, relationship between the human self-reference to the material world, the material world. In the medieval times, there is no discontinuity. If the human self-reference is body and spirit, then there's a contiguity with the material world and we inhabit a world created by God to be inhabited by us. And this is actually a position to which uh, early modern times likes to come back to in existential situations. I think that Peter Sloterdijk's beautiful three-part books on spheres is about that. How in certain situations you can come back to a worldview where you are surrounded by a material world, not only a spiritual world, but the predominant. Uh, early modern um, relationship to the material world is, of course, one of being outside. The subject, capital S, as pure consciousness, has to be outside the material world, has to be an observer of the material world. I mean, this is, of course, the foundation of the subject-object relationship, which is a condition for the humanities to emerge later. And finally, and most importantly, um, production of knowledge. In medieval culture, so to speak, in Western medieval culture, there is no production of knowledge. Every knowledge that humans dispose of is knowledge revealed. And it is God who decides how much she or he wants to reveal or not. It is never enough because you know it is, will always be incomplete. Whereas, and this is the big innovation, of course, of early modernity, with early modernity and within the subject-object paradigm, the production of knowledge 
becomes the description and interpretation and analysis of the material world. So long before enlightenment, there was a huge process of revision of knowledge going on. A process of revision of knowledge, and this is now important, which was done only by the mind, bracketing the physical, the perceptual relationship to the world. Rationality in the 17th century means that you analyze the world bracketing the physical relationship. You analyze the world only with your spirit. Is that clear? I think these are not the humanities or the Geisteswissenschaften yet, but these three conditions have to be there for something like the humanities, like our operation to emerge. Now, the second of my six quick step steps is the one that is normally not made or only casually made, but I think for this philology side in my polarity, it is very important. I want to make a stop in 1737, and this is the year in which Alexander Baumgarten at the University of Halle, H-A-L-L-E for the Americans, close to Leipzig, which then was by far the most important German university, finished his master's thesis. I always find this very encouraging that you can be so important with a master's thesis on, and I translate the Latin title, Some Conditions of Poems. Yeah? Uh, conditionibus poeme. Now, what was he talking all about? I mean, this book or this manuscript became important because it was the first time that in Latin the word aesthetics was used in the way we are using it today in relation to what we call art. No longer with the etymology of aesthesis, perception. Now what does really uh, Baumgarten say? It's mainly about prosody. He's saying against rationality, so to speak, that there are certain intentional objects, he doesn't use the word intentional objects, namely the recitation of a poem where if you want to get to the content of the poem, you cannot avoid to be simultaneously exposed to the prosody, to the rhythm of the poem, to the rhymes of the poem, which cannot be transposed into meaning. You get the point. So there are certain intentional objects where you cannot bracket the perceptual dimension, where you cannot bracket the perceptual dimension, where you cannot be perfectly rational. He doesn't say where it cannot be perfectly rational, but that's what he means. And that's what, why he finds uh, poems interesting, fascinating, and at the same time paradigmatic. And this is what he calls aesthetics. Yeah. I mean, this not, not just the prosody, but the simultaneity of prosody in the case of a poem. And you could see what the analogy in, art, in an artwork would be, what the analogy in music would be. But you get my point, there is an objectivity to this prosody. So if I would all of a sudden, which I won't, um, recite you a poem in Portuguese or Spanish or something like that, uh, you would get the prosody in an objective way. Your bodies would be exposed to those sound waves independently, I think, radically independently, but simultaneously with the content of the poem. But you would be exposed to that even if it happened in a language that you don't know. You get my point? This is why I think that aesthetics, the way Baumgarten deals with it, is an important stage in this philological side. Yeah? I think aesthetics, in the sense that Baumgarten talks about it, has to do with this objectivity, with this aesthetic, this perceptual objectivity. The way the German idealism, especially Kant and Hegel, in marvelous ways developed aesthetics has very little to do with this polarity. I mean, they picked up the concept that Baumgarten had created and developed it in very different directions. And I'm by no means belittling that. But what interests me is this perceptual side in Baumgarten, which comes back in certain approaches to aesthetics in 19th century philosophy. I think, for example, in Kierkegaard's Either Or, when he talks about music, this plays a role. I think in certain paragraphs uh, in Schopenhauer, when he talks about aesthetics, about music again, this plays a role, this objectivity plays a role. They don't call it objectivity, they don't even call it aesthetics necessarily, but there is this perceptual dimension. You get my point. So how is it going with the quick step through the humanities? Thank you. I wanted to see that, Marcus. <laughs> okay, uh, third chapter. 
And we are doing okay with time, I think. The third chapter is now mainly, again, about the in interpretative side, the, the explosive side. Yeah? And this starts, actually, in the plus minus third quarter of the 18th century, so mid-enlightenment, like if you're in New York, our hotel is in Midtown, I think of mid-enlightenment, Mittelaufklärung, what one normally doesn't say. But you can observe, you can document that, that all of a sudden, within a small group of the population, the intellectuals, in the 18th century, word for intellectuals in French, the coiné of the 18th century is les philosophes. Yeah, today, philosophers, with some glorious exceptions, are people on the payroll of a state institution and are, get retired at age 65. No, in the 18th century, philosophes were intellectuals. You can observe how, especially in France, in England and partly in Germany, intellectuals habitually become second order observers. People, subject, object, who cannot help observing themselves in the act of world observation. This is not programmatic, you can just document that. I mean, if you know about the 18th century. And it happens a little bit later in Germany, but, but Lessing is a typical case. I mean, Lessing cannot help observing himself in the act of world observation, for example. So that you don't think, I think, only of philosophers in the present day sense. Now this has a consequence, and the consequence is perspectivism. Because a self-observing observer will discover that her way of experiencing an intentional object depends on her perspective. And as she will quickly realize that there's always a potential infinity of perspectives, you have an infinity of experiences, plural not existing, for each intentional object. And that is simply a mess. People suffer from that. As you can also show, my favorite case of showing that is the correspondence of my favorite German literary classic, Heinrich von Kleist, who after all was an artillery officer and who wrote in the letters to his fiancée Wilhelmine, if Kant is right with his plurality, with his perspectivism, then I don't want to live. I mean, he was craving for what we call today the referent. I mean, the eindeutige interpretation. But there is this plurality. And this plurality is something that people would suffer. Now, this is the first time that I want to show how this plurality of interpretation was bound back by the humanities to an objectivity. And how did that happen? I think retrospectively, we can say, although this was not meant to be a solution, it happened through what Michel Foucault, with a beautiful phrase called Historisation des êtres. I like that. Historisation des êtres. It's very, I mean, historization of everything. Of everything. Now, what is historisation of everything in Foucault's sense? It means that from around plus minus 1800 on, you realize that ontological questions will have narrative answers. Yeah? For example, from around 1800 on, a question like, what is New York, New York City, will have a narrative, a historical answer. Or a biological question, what is a horse, will have a pre-evolutionary answer, yeah? a pre-evolutionary answer. Or if you go by the name of Hegel and are a young privatdozent at Jena and ask yourself, what is the spirit? You write the phenomenology of the spirit, which is a narrative, an evolutionary, in its own sense, narrative. Now, why is this a solution to perspectivism? I think it is a solution to perspectivism because, for two reasons, because a narrative discourse allows you to integrate different takes on the intentional object, on the object of narrative, and it also allows you, famously in Hegel, to postpone the moment of truth. There will be a moment of truth, not right now, but there will be a moment of truth, you know, at the end of history, whenever that will be, or in the class-free society, as Marx later on would say. But you get my point? Um, narrativization or historisation des êtres becomes a means of binding back this explosion of interpretative plurality to objectivity. Is that clear? At the same time, and I think this is important, uh, based on this historicization, uh, something is emerging that we can call the historical worldview which we can interpret, Marcus, this would be a Forschungsprojekt for you and me at Stanford, either one of those overextended worldviews that we should avoid, but we could also say that Historische Weltbild is just an organization of everydayness in the 19th century. I mean, you know, Fortschritt, progress, 
I mean, this is always this projection ahead of time. Now, uh, how can we describe this um, uh, historical worldview that emerges out of historicization? I mean, we can describe it by summarizing uh, the life work of Reinhard Koselleck. And I like to make a point whenever I talk about something German in the context of my country, the United States, to mention Reinhard Koselleck, which I think was the most inspirational German humanist in the second half of the 20th century. I'm saying that in full awareness of the competition. Uh, so I'm not saying Bloomberg. Uh, how did he describe the historical worldview? It was the worldview where, for the first time, the future appears to be an open horizon of possibilities that humans can shape. It was the worldview in which, secondly, the past was receding behind ourselves. And to the degree that the gap, the chronological gap between the present and the past is growing, the past is losing orientational power, Verbindlichkeit. It was the worldview in which between that open future and this receding past, the present was becoming, as Baudelaire formulated in Peintre de la Vie Moderne in 1864, an imperceptibly short moment of transition. And now comes the important thing. This imperceptibly short present was the epistemological place of the subject, where the subject, capital S, based on experience of the past, was trying to shape the future. And this shaping of the future, and this is important, and I want you to keep that in mind, was happening within what we can call a field of contingency. Contingency being the range of possibilities from which you can choose, but feel because it was surrounded on the one hand, on the one side, by necessity, certain things you could not choose, and I will give you examples later on, and on the other side, by impossibility, things that you could imagine but not attribute to humans. So you were not completely free to choose, but you were making these choices within a field of um, possibilities. Now, fourth step. Chronologically, at the same time, I think we can say the humanities exist on the one hand because there's a historical worldview, but they don't exist because nobody talks about the Geisteswissenschaften yet. I mean, they are Erstbeleg in the 18th century, but they are not institutional. So they exist and don't exist. But I think it is clear you can say the first university professorships of the humanities were institutionalized at German universities for German studies, German literature in the 18-teens. So you can clearly say literary studies has an institution beginning. It doesn't make it better or worse than the humanities, but it has a beginning. Now, what is the hypothesis? Why does this start? That is not clear. My hypothesis would be that it has to do with a consequence of the bourgeois revolutions, regardless of whether it had taken or not taken place in certain national contexts, in the sense that the bourgeois revolutions had formulated a normative image of life and society, a promise to the citizen what her and his life would be. But on the other hand, now that the in France or in England that these revolutions had happened, there was an everyday experience of everyday reality that did not correspond to this image. And I believe that reading literature in the early 19th century, in the time of Romanticism, became a zone of mediation, of consolation and mediation, where literature was explaining you that perhaps this normative image could be reached one day, or that perhaps your everyday experience was not so different. What I'm saying is, that especially in England and France, the early literary studies became a mediation of interpretation, of existential interpretation. Yeah, you were interpreting texts from the past, classical texts from the past, relating to an existential situation of disappointment. This, I think, explains why hermeneutics is getting going for the first time ever. And of course, I'm referring to Schleiermacher. I mean, what is Schleiermacher's problem with hermeneutics? It is the question, historical worldview, how can you relate texts, in this case the text of the scriptures, almost 2,000 years old, already in the early 19th century, to the existential situation of believers in the 19th century? This is how hermeneutics gets going. So I think in this context, 
the beginning of literary studies and the beginning of the hermeneutic reflection has something to do. But this is all on the interpretative pole. There's something fascinating happening on the philological pole because in those nations or national cultures, because Germany was far from being a nation then politically, uh, that had not undergone a bourgeois revolution, the ideal image of society was an image of the past. In the German case, the Middle Ages, or rather how the Grimm brothers, for example, imagined the Middle Ages. And in the Italian case, also no bourgeois revolution, classical antiquity. And this is, of course, where philology became absolutely important. Because it became important because you had to reconstruct texts from the Middle Ages. This is what the Grimm brothers mainly do. And their collections of tales, of course, is the same effort. In oral transmission, you want to get to a, to, to, to a glorious moment of the national culture in the past. In this context, the Italian context, the German context, to a certain degree, the Spanish context, reconstructing texts from the past, philologically reconstructing texts from the past, um, does not have so much to do with interpretation. Those texts become relics of a glorious past. And their objectivity is to be, be relics from a glorious past. You recite those texts. You recite medieval Minnesang in Mittelhochdeutsch. Nobody really knows what the phonetics were. But, but you recite it because you want to make it present. Now, you see, there is this polarity within literary studies and the humanities, even in the early 19th century. Fifth step of the sixth step, quick step, so we are almost uh, at the end. In this formation, what I have been describing, historical worldview, emergence of literary studies, hermeneutic reflection, in this formation, the humanities, or the Geisteswissenschaften, avant la lettre, because nobody calls them humanities yet, and literary studies in their context, were so successful that one of the literary critics of my previous generation that I admire the most, not only in the German context, Wolfgang Iser, not Iser, Wolfgang Iser of the act of reading was once saying, and I think it's a beautiful description, that literary studies and the humanities became the new theology for a bourgeois society that had elevated aesthetic experience to the level of religion. Yeah? So I think the, gr the glory, the golden age of the humanities was an age of la lettre, yeah? was the age in the 19th century where it, indeed I think this, this metonymy by Isa is genius. It was functioning as a theology. There couldn't be enough of this theology. The first symptoms of a crisis that we can realize come in the late 19th century. And they're very, very different. One crisis condition is, of course, the absolutely stunning rise of the sciences, the natural sciences. And as there's no institution distinction yet between sciences of the spirit, humanities, and natural sciences, there's a direct competition. So it is important to, to realize that historically, the division between the humanities and the natural sciences that happens in the late 19th century is not an activity of separation from the side of the natural sciences. It is the humanities that try to withdraw from the pressure of the sciences, and very understandably. I mean, this is the age when the first Nobel was awarded. Actually, being born in Würzburg, I'm always proud to say that the first Nobel laureate in the history was a professor in Würzburg, and that was Röntgen the inventor of the X-rays. That was the first Nobel ever officially announced in the year 1901. Anyway, the second uh, problem is a very different problem. It's a philosophical problem, um, an epistemological problem, typical for the late 19th century. And this is the situation of Bergson and the situation of Husserl. It is the situation of phenomenology, capital P, as a historical name. It is the situation in which the hope is given up that within the subject-object formation, you will ever achieve objectivity. 
You can only achieve objectivity. I think that is the premise of any type of phenomenology, may it be Bergson or may it be Husserl or may it be somebody else. If you become aware of your own pre-orientation and somehow discount your pre-orientation from the image, from the experience of reality that you're getting, then you achieve objectivity. But that problem, that problem becomes a problem for the humanities as they had been practiced during the 19th century. We can then say that the discussions in France around Durkheim and others, foundation of les sciences humaines as opposed to les sciences sociales and les sciences naturelles, in Germany there's no social sciences in spite of Max Weber, in Germany it is Diltai. Diltai's life work since he arrived at the today Humboldt University at Berlin, the Universität zu Berlin in 1888, he soon becomes a dean, is to describe for the first time what the humanities can be like. And he describes it in three ways, normally in two ways, but you will see soon why I'm mentioning three ways. In the first place, and that is generally known, the common denominator of all that disciplines that withdraw from the natural sciences to become the Geisteswissenschaften, the sciences of the spirit, is interpretation, is meaning attribution. And um, Dilta makes it quite clear, not only interpretation of texts, but interpretation of any product of the human spirit. It can be interpretation of music, whatever that exactly means, interpretation of artworks, etc., philosophy, etc., etc. It's interpretation is the common denominator. I would say that compared to the natural sciences, and Georg Lukacs was making this remark, this foundation moment comes with a fear of a world loss. If all we can do in the humanities is interpretation, are we not losing the real world? I mean, this is not what Dilta is saying, but I think this becomes typical for the discipline. The second condition for the sciences of the spirit in Dilta is the invention of the concept of the hermeneutic circle. I mean, this consideration was already there in Schleiermacher, but the concept, the metonymy of the hermeneutic circle was invented by Diltai, and that is precisely this movement in order to be objective. This is recovering objectivity again. In order to be objective, you have to be fully aware of your pre-orientations. And once you're fully aware of your pre-orientations, you can, so to speak, discount that from your world experience and are objective. Yeah. And that is quite plausible around 1900. But I want to mention one third element in Diltai, and that is an element that he is normally criticized for as incoherent. The word Erleben, lived experience, plays a strange role in Diltai's image of the humanities. What does Erleben mean phenomenologically? Well, Erleben is precisely the state where you have an intentional object, so it is there, but you have not attributed meaning to it. So Erleben, for example, would be exactly the status of prosody. So Marcus and I, as a duo, recite a Portuguese poem for you. You wouldn't understand a word, but you would be exposed to the prosody. You couldn't attribute any meaning to it, but that would be Erleben. Now, I find it interesting, and that is an interpretation of Diltai, that Diltai, for some reason, never gives, gives up on this dimension of Erleben. I think with the dimension of Erleben, Diltai, so to speak, keeps a place within the humanities for this philological pole, for this objectivity pole, for this existential objectivity pole. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but I, you know, after so many years and decades of always saying bad things about Diltai, I wanted to say something <laughs> redeeming about him. Now, final and last stage in this uh, history of the humanities, and Marcus will disagree, but we have to disagree sometimes, Marcus. I think it is only a slight exaggeration to say that ever since this foundational moment, now the humanities exist as sciences humaines, as the humanities in the English speaking context. There is no equivalent to Dilta or Durkheim in the, in the English context, but you know, there are reflections at the Ivy Leagues, at the uh, certainly English, I mean, at Oxbridge and so forth. The humanities exist. And I would say ever since they exist, um, their own crisis management has been an important part of their survival. 
Yeah, I would say maybe if the humanities had not declared to be in permanent crisis and always taking care of their own crisis moments, maybe they would not have survived. I mean, this is, of course, hyperbole intended, sapient hyperbole intended. But I think it is rather true to say that had it not be for this trauma of the world loss, Weltverlust, yeah, that we only do interpretation. We don't do what the naturals, what the medi but what medicine does, what physics does, but the classical sciences, as we call them today, do what engineering does. Had it not been for this feeling of world loss, I think, we could not explain why some of the most eminent colleagues of ours, predecessors of ours, uh, in the early and mid 20th century, were ready to lend themselves to the formulation of not only overextended but dangerous worldviews. Why some of the most eminent Germanists, for example, contributed to a fascist worldview or to a Nazi worldview? Why some of the most eminent uh, left-wing intellectuals contributed not just to left-wing worldviews but to communism as an ideology? This, unfortunately, is not the original sin of the humanities, but the sin of the humanities, the historical sin of the humanities. We cannot forget that under the premise of objectivity, predecessors of ours and eminent predecessors, unfortunately, were contributing to these ideologies. Had they read Marcus's books on uh, new realism, perhaps they wouldn't, but they came too late. That happens. Shit happens. Uh, <laughs> What we can say historically is that the mid 19th, the mid 20th century in the Western context is a reaction to that. This is the time called, this is my, my high school years, uh, imminent interpretation. You concentrate only on the text. You concentrate only on the artwork. You avoid any, any historical contextualization. This is a stage of, of purification, so to speak. And it is followed by this loud moment of the Geisteswissenschaften on the humanities, not only in Europe, but I would say between the East Coast, or maybe also the West Coast, North America and Europe, by this loud moment of the theory explosion, starting in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, that is pretty much my intellectual generation. I was growing into this situation. Where, you know, every day you had to wake up and say, what was the latest term? So it was neo-Freudianism, neo-Marxism, reception theory, deconstruction, new historicism, identity theories, gender theories, etc., etc. There was always a new theory explosion. I think, I mean, having lived through that time, that this was a time when the humanities had much more public attention than today. But I fear it was not for the better. I fear that may be a disagreement that we have, Marcus, and it may also be generational between the two of us, maybe also between Kai and, and, and myself, um, that the humanities are still suffering from that moment. Yeah? I mean, the trust that the humanities can do something that matters outside the humanities was lost then. I'm not saying it's irrecuperable. But if you, the next generations, want to do something about the status of the humanities, I think uh, this has to be taken into account. Now, from this moment of theory explosion, I want to highlight two developments. I'm not saying these are the only developments that are important, but they both have to do with my polls. Interpretation on the one side and this objectivity on the other side. I do think that it is a time where, for the first time, hermeneutics, and I'm thinking, for example, of Gadamer's Truth and Method. This is strange. Late in my life, I do not only like Gadamer a lot. I mean, he was, I don't know whether anybody ever met him personally. I think he so deeply believed in consensus because he was the most charming person on the planet. I mean, he was irresistible, so wherever he appeared, people wanted to agree. I mean, you know, I invited him. I remember when I invited him to Siegen, I wanted to really disagree, but then he was so charming. He could, he could just not disagree. But I think that Gadamer, for the first time, wrote a hermeneutics, and it was more his teaching, his presence in Heidelberg, I think, than, than this book, really, which is actually a not so well-construed collection of, of, of lectures. 
was the first time in hermeneutics where you think that the confrontation with, as he called them, eminent texts from the past would produce an explosion of interpretations that you would not necessarily have to bind back into objectivity, yeah, neither by historicization nor by the hermeneutic circle, yeah? but rather you would leave this overproduction of ideas, this triggering imagination, yeah? I mean, this is a new type where you don't feel you have to achieve, ob achieve objectivity to bind it back to one consensus uh, on the interpretation side, but where you would connect with what I call riskful thinking. Namely, ideas being produced in a confrontation with the eminent texts and artworks and music from the past, ideas that you would not formulate in your professional everyday, ideas that were too riskful, too too ecstatic, too exaggerated to be produced in the everyday, but ideas nevertheless that we can use to have a greater flexibility, to have a broader approach to the world. I will come back to that point. You get my point? I say it is part of this theory explosion that for the first time you have a hermeneutics that are explosive in the sense of their productivity, but without the attempt of being bound back to objectivity. At the same time, and relatively late in the theory explosion, mainly in medieval studies, but not exclusively, there was the so-called new philology movement. The new philology movement, a movement of philology for the first time that would not relate the physical contact with the text and products of the human spirit from the past back to interpretation back to text editing, a movement for the first time that would allow for this purely perceptual relationship to objects from the past that had always been potentially there, but new philology declared it was for the first time legitimate. For the first time, there was a new philology that would just provide focal points, that would just provide physical points to hold on to in complex existential situations. For those among you uh, who are interested in classics, uh, I want to mention one colleague, um, generation-wise, between Marcus and myself, and whom Marcus knows well, Jürgen Schwind in Heidelberg. I mean, he's an eminent Lat Latinist who practices what he calls radical philology. And this is a reading and interpretation of uh, the Latin text from the Augustan age, which is not interpretative, yeah. which really focuses on the materiality of the text, the cause of an atomization of this materiality. Yeah. And I think, I don't know how much I really agree with this radical philology. I enjoy it a lot. And I think it has an implication of philological objectivity that is explicitly aesthetic and that has a certain future. So yes, I mean, there has been too much taking notes and too much kind of approving, uh, uh, head shaking, or maybe it was disapprovement. I finally arrived at my final consideration. That would take me another 10 minutes. Can you still hold on to that? Another 10 minutes? OK. Another 10 minutes. So what do we do with this legacy? You see, I have been trying to accumulate this legacy of the interpretative pole and the philological pole. What do we do with that in the present existential situation? Now, I would love, because I love talking, but um, which is bad, <laughs> I would love to give you a full analysis, my full analysis of the 2021 present, but I cannot do that. Let me just focus on two poles. In the first place, and this has no doubt already been part of your discussions here, in the first place, as a consequence, as a long-term consequence, of the separation between subject and object in late 19th, late 19th century phenomenology, constructivism had emerged in the mid 20th century. Constructivism, which was giving up objectivity claims, yeah, in which objectivity was replaced by consensus. Consensus theory der Wahrheit, as Jürgen Habermas would then say. Um, I'm old enough probably the oldest here in the room, to remember how enthusiastic we all were about constructivism. But I'm also old enough to have lived fully through this progressive disappointment with constructivism. 
I thought if it was not for this disappointment with constructivism, we would not be here this morning trying to discuss as an aspect of the future of humanities, what can be objectivity. So I think this desire for objectivity, I will not say in full awareness of its impossibility, but in full awareness of its difficulty is a decisive part of our present day intellectual situation, not only within the humanities. I think it is very important within the humanities, but not only within the humanities. Secondly, if we can say that ever since the early 19th century in Western cultures, every dayness was built, was founded in the temporality of the historical worldview as I have been describing it. I think we are living our everyday today in Western culture, maybe in global culture as an extension of Western culture, which is politically problematic, but nevertheless the fact, in a very different temporality that I have tried to call the broad present, and I can briefly describe like that. In the broad present, in the temporality with which we awake, and if we are smokers, smoke the first morning cigarette, but there's no smoker here. Uh, in the broad present, the future is no longer an open horizon of possibilities that we can shape, but the future is occupied by threats that are slowly coming towards us. You know, global warming, so far demographic development, you name them. I don't want to eliminate them, for Christ's sake, but, but it is not even important whether they're objective or not. This is the future. There are threats that are coming toward us. I think in this broad present, the past is no longer something that recedes behind us. But I think on the contrary, largely due to electronic storage capacities, the past is inundating the present. There is no important document from the past that is not available on any laptop screen, I mean, if you're good enough doing it. Yeah? There is not a single day in the year that's not quint triply or quintuply booked as a memorial day. Every day is a memorial day. We, we are inundated by pastness. I'm not saying we understand the past better, but we are inundated by pastness. Everything is memorial. Everything is memorial. Now, I think that between this congested or that congested future and this aggressive past, the present is no longer this imperceptibly short moment of transition, but an ever broadening present of complexity. A present that is over complex. A present that if we associated the short present with the Cartesian self-reference, the subject, would explain why now we have this desire to recuperate the body. May this be in neurophilosophy, which I have no clue about, or in your morning jogging, on your morning exercise, but who does not do a morning exercise? Try to recuperate the body, but above all, I think it is a present in whose over complexity, we suffer from that complexity, we no longer process our everyday within a field of contingency, but within what I would like to describe as a universe of contingency. Remember, I said field of contingency, contingency choice between necessity on the one side and impossibility on the other side. Metaphorically speaking, I think in the present, these poles are melting. What does this mean? On the necessity side, I'll give you one example. There have always been humans born with male genitals who knew that they were women. But, and I say who knew that they were women. But in the olden days, as you would say in German, das war Pech gehabt. Yeah? I mean, there was the necessity you were defined by your genitals. There was no way. Now, we have, thank goodness, transsexual surgery, and it is making progress. That's what I mean. I have no clue how far this will go. But this is what I mean by melting. On the other hand, we have always been able to imagine capacities and faculties that were beyond humans. And we were attributing them to divinities. Yeah? 
We have always imagined omniscience. We have always imagined uh, omnipotence. We have always imagined omnipresence, but, but this couldn't exist. Now, I would say, and I say it provocatively, in the age of Wikipedia, are we not somehow omniscient? I mean, this, this knowledge that you can just have at hand, the quantity of knowledge is completely overbearing. You can then say, oh, this, this Wikipedia entry is not so good. It doesn't matter. But, but what you have, or omnipresence. Yeah, it doesn't really matter that I'm here physically. We could do that via Zoom. It would be different, but nevertheless, I could be here. So you get my point. These poles are melting. And while I think we should appreciate and praise the acquisition of liberty we gain with this melting of the poles, transsexual surgery, omnipresence, omniscience, etc., etc., it is also existentially overbearing. It is a situation, this universe of contingency, where we easily lose focus, where we have more time than ever, but we don't know what to do with this time, where we have a desire to hold on to something, and I like this possibility in American English, to hold on to something, but there is nothing to hold on to. So these would be my two descriptions, of course, incomplete, of the present situation. Now, what can be existentially the investment, I wouldn't say the application of the humanities and in the larger context of the humanities of literary studies in the situation, what, what, what can we do in the situation? I'll say in the first place, and this might again be a discussion between you, you and me, Marcus, a polemical discussion, maybe we continue in the end, etc. Uh, I think our market, so to speak, should be individuals. I doubt that uh, we are in a position today with the humanities. Maybe this has to do with how I see this crisis in the late 19th century. I cannot really see politicians. Um, I can see groups like the Swiss group Lust inviting you and me, and they're influential people. But, but politicians, I don't see. Maybe, OK. But I think we should talk to, to individuals who are interested in this situation. Yeah? And for individuals, so to speak, whatever that means, uh, I have two ideas. In the first place, and I will give you just one example, I think we could use this plethora of interpretative ideas triggered by imagination in confrontation with eminent works from the past, this plethora of ideas, images of riskful thinking that we have not to fight against the gloominess of the present situation, to fight against those threats that are coming towards us from the future, not to eliminate them. That would be a mistake. But to experience them in a different way. Let me give you an example. I mean, there is much talking these days of a departure of the humans from the planet yeah? and how that will be. No, I mean, this is, I mean, now, instead of saying, oh, this will never happen, and we will fight it, and we can stop climate, maybe we cannot stop climate change. But as I was recently arguing, or if there's an argument, in a colloquium with Catholic theologians, we can reformulate that with the tradition of parousia, for example. Could that not be a situation of redemption? Could we not think, for example, of what would be a dignified departure of the planet? Instead of thinking, no, 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 humans have to always be on the planet. You get my point. I mean, this is riskful thinking, but this, these are ideas that we have from the confrontation of great texts from the past. I was now talking about religious texts. doesn't have to be religious texts. You get my point. I mean, to invest this capital of interpretation in present existential situations. As for the powers of philology, this aesthetic relationship to the objectivity of products from the past, texts, artwork, music. I think in the present situation of the universe of contingency, of the situation where we are running the risk of losing focus, they could provide us precisely this focus of concentration, this existential horizon to hold on to in this situation of psychological overload. Yeah? 
I mean, I was saying at the beginning how much I like to sit in a circle. So if we would do a philological exercise, we would just focus on a short poem. And Kai, for example, would recite a Goethe poem here for you, or Marcus would recite a Giorgi Andrade poem for you. And we would just focus on that. Then we go outside and we live again in the universe of contingency. But we would have this moment of focusing. That's what I mean. Let us direct us primarily to individuals. You can see whether we can create this morning a moment of concentration. Now, such hermeneutic activation of imagination, that's what it really is on the interpretative side. And such philological emergence and creation of a focus and of a Verbindlichkeit, to come back to our favorite word, would require new forms of teaching, forms of teaching that would no longer focus on the transmission of knowledge. And I think, actually, this has been a great error of the humanities. I mean, the transmission of knowledge has never been the focus of the humanities. It has always been these events of having a common focus. We would have to invent institutionally not yet existing forms of teaching, which at the same time we all know from the rare charismatic moments of our teaching. Yeah. I think we have all had moments of teaching. I mean, if I'm not too over optimistic, this is not teaching. I find this is a moment. I mean, if, if I'm looking around, we are all concentrated on the same argument. And this is a good moment. So it can happen. But we have no institutional form how this happens. Something may have happened this morning. Something may have happened yesterday. Something happens in the class you are teaching. You know when it happens. But you don't know how to institutionally achieve it. Now, instead of giving you the answer of how to institutionally achieve it, I will remind you of the fact that I'm an emeritus. And the task is with you to invent these institutionally adequate forms to to, to, to activate hermeneutic plurality and complexity and philological objectivity. So many things. Yeah, that was a wonderful and magisterial, really, overview um, uh, of the humanities from note cards. Um, can I abuse my position as the uh, moderator to ask the first question? Please. 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 You can answer that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can answer that question, too. So, <laughs> so um, uh, I mean, you, you have no way of knowing, actually, how well your remarks uh, fit into some of the discussion we've been having so far. So I knew it. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, you mean you well. So, so to be precise, you know, the hermeneutic side of your story um, is part of what I think all of what Marcus has been defending and the view of art he's been putting forward as interpretation dependent objects. That would be a good a good way of thinking of, uh, sure. of, of what you said about hermeneutics, and you're resisting him in your polemic uh, in ways I agree with by insisting on the philological dimension. So something about how the transmission of whatever it is we're interpreting depends on some materiality preserved out of the um, without philology, what would the humanities be? So um, if, we, if we take those two, those two things together, both of those depend on, um, in ways you made implicit in everything you said in the history you reconstructed, something like the activity of collecting, sorting, archiving, um, keeping straight what we want in, what we want out. And then at the very end of your talk, you reminded us that it's that possibility of sorting, editing, collecting, deciding what goes in and what goes out that we're losing. Nothing goes out. I think the way you put it yeah. was the inundation Beautiful. of the past yeah. onto Good. the present. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, so my, my question really for you, and I think also the, a question I think for the group to consider in the next few days, is what kinds of pressures does this inundation of the past on the present, accumulation without end, the mess we're making, is a, is a way I, I, I like to think of it. Um, what kinds of pressures does that put on the vision of the humanities that you ended with? Mm -hmm. Where, OK, we come together in a quasi-religious way to attend to a poem, a text, a charismatic teacher. Um, 
But that seems to me to sit alongside this problem of accumulation, not really to speak to it or to answer it. Um, and so I wonder if we could be a bit more precise or think a bit more about how the challenge of losing the ability to decide between collections and just keeping everything, um, how that pressure might be taken up in humanistic study. Yeah. Shall I answer or should Marcus? No, no, please answer. I mean, so I, I give you two answers. One is very short. I mean, that's your problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, really. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean it in a serious way. Well, you're not, you're not gone yet. <laughs> no, I'm. I'm not gone yet, but I'm institutionally gone. I mean, for example, uh, at this point, there's. Uh, there are the this week there are lectures at Stanford for my succession. I mean, the next Albert Gara professor in literature. And I'm not saying that this is why I came to New York to be absent, but I thought it was nice to not be around, right? I mean, to take an institution distance and say, okay, I've been teaching at Stanford for 20, 29 years. Um, you know, I think altogether in those 29 years, I was one out of 50 people who have made the humanities better. That's what I've done. It's not my, okay. I mean, this is, comes back to what I was saying at the end and all I was saying, you have to think about the problem. I have no solution. Um, if I try to give an answer, this answer would have to do, but it's just the beginning of an answer, uh, with what I was saying towards the end. I mean, by the way, your point, of course, is extremely well taken, this inundation of pastness. Because we normally say, oh, we don't know anything about the past. Now, we have never, the average knowledge of people about the past has never been so massive as now. Yeah? And everything is at hand. I mean, yes, I mean, I could see that you had this, this interaction when I was making this point. Every historically relevant document can be, I mean, potentially on any laptop screen. But whether people can activate it or not. And this is an overcomplexity. What can we do with that? Just archiving, archiving more and more and more and having more and more and more documents cannot be the solution. I agree with you. But the point I was making towards the end was saying, let's think about a market of individuals. Yeah, let's think about these gettings together where you get an impression um, has to do with your talent as your teacher or not, but that certain texts, I will give you an example, that certain texts function better than others. And that would be a first indication. I mean, I give you an example um, that the most difficult thing I have done in my professional life uh, was something, the first thing I did as an emeritus, and that was a translation of a Spanish 17th century text, very, very difficult text, into German. And this was Gracian's Oraculum Manual. Now, I was translating that, the first translation, can you believe that the first German translation ever was with Schopenhauer? So I was competing for half a year every morning with Schopenhauer, and Schopenhauer's translation is fantastic. And the translation came out, and it's not the best server, but it sold an unheard amount of copies. And that is not because I'm the translator. I mean, I would love to say that, but unfortunately it's not. That because it turns out that this text has an appeal, and even my translation into German is more difficult to read than Schopenhauer's because I tried to stay close. So get my point, this is an example of saying, why not use the adjective, this is a charismatic text. And the fact that Reklam, you know what Reklam in German is, I mean, these editions that, that they can use at schools brought this text out as an important, I mean, important example. I give you another example, and that's the Udo Keller Foundation. The Udo Keller Foundation within Zurkamp Verlag, which I do think is the best, Markus and I both think, because we published there, the best German editor, Zurkamp, they bring out a, a library of religion. Yeah. And in the Library of Religion, uh, they publish certain texts from the theological religious tradition that are charismatic texts that deserve to be preserved. And this cannot just be archival. I mean, what comes out in this collection is specific. And what could be the criteria? I don't think that they're objective political criteria. You have to figure out what works. I mean, here is a uh, former student of mine, Sam Gill. I mean, an eminent uh, uh, producer of artificial intelligence, but who double majored and also majored in comparative literature. And he remembers certain texts from seminars at Stanford that you could not argue in general uh, were spellbinding. But remember, in my very last seminar, this Clarice Lispector, this is a more or less contemporary Brazilian woman author, 
That was charismatic. That captured people's attention. So this is too long an answer, but I'm saying I don't see objective criteria. I think for this re selection, you have to see what works, what produces these moments. And the Gracian example and the example of the uh, Bibliothèque de Religion in, in Surkamp is a good example of how one could proceed. Yeah. I don't believe in general institutional solutions in that case. Marcus. Well, thank you. There's so much to say, of course. Uh, um, so let me also add something to your uh, very interesting diagnosis of the present, which I think was, of course, you know, an application of a certain capacity for reading, right, structuring a field with concepts, including, of course, the concept of presence, right? Which looked like, only used once. Yeah, yeah but, you know, like if you thought of the present, right, the broad present. Yeah in a very interesting way, right? And I think this particular way of characterizing the present, which I will challenge in a second, right? This particular way of thinking about the present is exactly uh, 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 an act of uh, installing objectivity in the humanities uh, in a position where it matters, right? Mm -hmm. So you're responding, I think, uh, in, in very convincing ways uh, to, yeah, to, to my challenge, right? I mean, so humanists, what, what, if, what are you able to do? You're doing exactly, I think, what we ought to be doing. Now, now we are closer than we were a year ago. I completely yeah. agree. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I think uh, in, in various ways, right? So um, there's a certain response. Just don't let us get too close, because then we have nothing to talk yeah, about. Yeah, OK, yeah. That's, why, that's what I will do now. Right? Yeah. Okay, now we'll resist some of this, <laughs> yeah, right? Good. I think it's too American. Yeah, uh, so OK, I'm, good. Uh, yeah, I like I'm that. occupying a, you know, a European and a Chinese position here. There's a very different story to be told. <laughs> if you look at this from you know, a different perspective. Yeah. Let me give you an example, and then I'll challenge okay. the concept of the broad present mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, with an, uh, an alternative idea, with this, which is very much in line with the kinds of things that you've said about the explosion, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? So uh, uh, last night before I met uh, Paul, uh, I had a fantastic bottle of wine with Xi Dong Zhang, comparative literature professor at NYU, specializing in Chinese and German literature. And he claimed, which was very interesting, he's very close to the Communist Party, right? So he mm -hmm. goes in and out in power circles, uh, including Tencent and so forth, right? He's also with the tech billionaire ideological world in China. And he claims that China is following the path of Beethoven, mm -hmm. which he calls the other universal. He mm -hmm. thinks there's a, there's a, there, there, there are different traditions of the universal. And, uh, and he thinks that the German enlightenment was the production of an alternative universal, alternative with respect to what became the annual sphere, right? Mm -hmm. Which is now really becoming also an ideological block. Right? Mm -hmm. So you cannot, we have to get like complicated visa in order to enter the United States of America, whereas the Russian plane, which was in front of us, right? Borders, Russia has never been closed, you know, from and so forth, right? So the Russians could get in on Esther, we have to get visas in order to so much of be here, right? So sorry. So there, there, there's a restructuring of various, you know, geopolitical spaces, et cetera, et cetera. And, and now John's point was uh, to say that there's this alternative universal. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this alternative universal is very much built right, on writing uh, the kind of experience that you have been describing large and turning this into a political project. So when I lecture in the AI community in Shanghai, for instance, uh, so there's this thing called, check this out, Institute for AI Ideas. It's literally what they're called. It's one of the biggest AI institutions in Shanghai. And the head of this is not a tech guy, right? Uh, but the editor of Nietzsche's and Heidegger's Complete Works, uh, uh, the dean of the Philosophical Faculty at Tungji University, right? Uh, which has its own German heritage, including, for instance, the architecture school, which is one of the most influential architecture schools in the world. They designed the whole Pudong skyline, right? Mm -hmm. On the basis of this alternative universal. So if you if you take this into account, right, then I think what we ought to do is inquire with exactly the kinds of tools that you are giving us, right, uh, uh, what's going on right now uh, by bringing in also this transcultural perspective. Uh, um, uh, so that's why the, I think that you have given a very convincing uh, American reading of what's happening as the broad present, right, the theology is involved there. But there might be something else. And now I want to claim that the humanities are much more powerful than they ought to be. So I'm on your side. What happened, the theory explosion, right, was a, was a horrible moment for humanities, right? I think that constructivism, etc., 
you know, they they did like serious harm to humanity. Yeah, I, I mean it. It was know, the fullest possible sense of the term. This was and almost deliberately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah absolutely deliberate. It was very. You know, it was the uh, of course it was the European and American response to the Cultural Revolution. So again, we must not forget that also Mao sponsored some of this in Paris, right? Uh, uh, so there's like real geopolitical agency uh, uh, behind this, various forces, but this is what we ought to take into account. So my claim then, to sum this up, right, is that maybe what you call the broad present, among other things, is a transition from a, a critique of the metaphysics of presence to the presence of metaphysics. I think we're you know, in a fully metaphysical age in the most brutal possible way, which is why the horizons seem to be so close. But the metaphysics that is now like a, a causally active on a global scale right, is precisely uh, uh, you know, a, a ridiculous version of the theory explosion. So data, you know, we've been talking about data yesterday, the era of data and so forth, mm -hmm. right? A certain fascination with storage capacities, the inundation and so forth, uh, is, is, uh, is in a certain way, right, a comic uh, 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 presence of metaphysics. Yeah, so, I agree. So, you know, like, uh, uh, I would claim that. So the question is then, of course, right, how do we relate to the, relate to the threats, right? So what, what does it mean that the horizon is closed, right? And I think that we should overcome this idea. I, I think that we currently experience the horizon as closed in a certain way, right? But if you look at other world historical uh, actors, in particular China, right, then the horizon does precisely not look closed. So I think we need to challenge this idea that there's a singular uh, broad presence, but rather uh, a, a, a presence of metaphysics, uh, and that we need to, you know, as you know, this my spiel, right? We need to overcome this by getting rid of Kant's invention of worldviews. It was Kant in the Critique of Judgment who coined the word Weltanschau, paragraph 93, and the word did not exist. So the, the very idea of a worldview is precisely Kant's way of not being able to bear the non existence of the world, which he had discovered in the first critique. But he couldn't bear it, right? So uh, 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 and then, you know, like if this, if this is part of our story, right? I'm giving you just a, you know, just emphasizing mm -hmm. a different undercurrent. Yeah, sure. Which I think is yeah, also yeah, taking place in the story. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay, can so I? Much going on. I want you yeah. a little disagree. I'd like to yeah. get a few, few so, more. Please respond. Let's respond compactly because uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to have a long day talk, together. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, two reactions. Uh, one reaction about the plurality of worldviews. Yeah? I was uh, developing uh, this broad present view, but it was not meant so much as a singular as it came across, um, because I was trying not to say this is a, a worldview, I may have said worldview, but I'm saying this is how for most of us the everyday functions today. Yes, yeah? I mean, this is why I was saying this is example, you wake up and you don't think, oh, I can shape the future. No. I can still remember how this was the case when I was 20 years old and in the SDS, we were shaping the future every day. SDS was the communist student organization in Munich in Germany. I mean, I was studying in Munich, there were very few of us in Munich, but anyway. <laughs> um, no, that's not how you wake up today. You wake up and then think about global warming, some problem. So, so I'm not saying it's a worldview. Now, my point is, it is in the logic of how I described the past of this broad present that all the other temporalities are present, yeah? because nothing gets rejected. So you can still think about to shape the present, you can still think the Chinese way, you can create this institute, etc., etc. So that is the first answer. Second answer about metaphysics. I. It's almost too much that we agree this morning, Marcus, but I completely agree with you that what I try to describe, the universe of contingency, uh, is a everydayness that is more prone than anything you can imagine toward the production of metaphysics. Yes. Yeah? So it's the production of metaphysics you want a worldview to hold on to. And this is my short answer, but I think we can start there. This is why I was saying, let's not produce a worldview. Let's not talk to the world how to give orientations, but let's maybe concentrate on moments 
where we focus on a poem, where we focus on an artwork. I mean, Bredekamp's book on, on Michelangelo, for example, doesn't, I mean, just or what musicologists can do. We focus on something, and that is a starting point. So I mean this, this objectivity, this philological objectivity, precisely as a counter possibility towards metaphysics. Yeah? So the, the smaller, I mean, the smaller the circle, I don't want to make a romanticism, but, but you know, if in a seminar at Bonn or at Stanford or at the New School, you have 20 people for a quarter or for a semester that concentrate with you, that has a multi, that, that's good in the first place, and it has a multiplication effect that is much better than any metaphysics that some political party will pick up. Yeah. This also goes to the address of our friend Peter and, and the liberals these days, Kai, between us. It seems to me actually a pretty good answer to the last part of what you're saying, it seems to me, in the sense that, um, I mean, your accusation of Americanism and, and your invocation of Judon seems to me just frankly a straightforward ideology. Um, production of, production of yeah, well, that's what Americans say. But I was giving it. And the idea that attention to a text, or to a Michelangelo or whatever, is the antidote to any kind of ideological production of new universals. Um, seems to me. Quite and it's a very American answer because yeah. it's an answer in the spirit of new criticism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. 1950. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I got a line. Oh. So Natalie was first, yeah. and then Tobias, Nick, and then you. Yeah, thank you for your thought-provoking um, talk. So I come from reader response criticism and material eco-criticism. Wow. Yeah. And I say this because it's important to understand my hesitancy of using the word or the concept of objectivity uh, when it comes to literary analysis sure, in particular. Yeah. So um, so uh, my I've got two questions for, for mm -hmm. you. I try to keep them as short as possible. So my first question, and re it, this really goes out to all of, of you, is um, isn't it kind of an expression of human arrogance of us to say that we can somehow detach ourselves from the matters that we are trying to describe, especially in the humanities. Because I'd rather go with Karen Barat's uh, interactive worldview, which, uh, which says that um, it is only within phenomena, right? Um, which is, as she puts it, kind of the um, epistemological inseparable. Um, Separability. Exactly, of um, the observer and observed, right? Um, that sure. we can think to uh, begin to think reality and mm -hmm. to describe reality, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now um, the question would be, or just I would just hear your thoughts on that. So, um, that if there is really no knowledge to be, there is, I think there is no knowledge to be revealed, really, but only our subject, subjective take. Um, on the methods we are trying to describe, and which is a good thing. So in literary analysis, I cannot come, I think, to an objective uh, description of uh, the text, but on, it, it's only a variation, right? One specific variation of an interpretation, which is my interpretation, which is a good thing, because um, this is kind of what literature does. So, um, so yes. this is the first question. The second question after Oh, this I thought it was already two questions. Sorry. <laughs> Just a short one. And the second one is uh, concerned, you, you talk about the uh, two dimensions of uh, literary studies. So the first one was um, the phil philological yeah. dimension, the second one to the interpretation. Um, I've been working in the research training group in Bonn uh, with Professor Lehmann and Professor Stüssel, and um, some colleagues of mine were working in a new, relatively new field called praxeologic. Uh, mm -hmm. Praxeology. So they try to uh, look at how literature is made, so how art is made, and not just material, but how authors um, yeah. um, create artwork. So, mm -hmm. how do you think does this fit in um, to um, uh, into um, your differentiation between interpretation okay. and, uh, and, and uh, yeah. logic? Yeah. Okay, so I, I try to give compact answers. I mean, the questions have been all like to give another talk, which I would like to, but, but um, uh, so I try to be compact so that we can address the answers within the time uh, that we have. In the first place, yes. I mean, I didn't say that sentence, but uh, I would agree with your most radical sentence that it is a symptom of human arrogance to think that you can detach yourself from the object. And this is precisely because um, 
I mean, if there was any quote-unquote philosophical contribution in my talk, it was to begin to develop a different concept of objectivity. Mm -hmm. A concept of objectivity that does not produce knowledge, but a concept of objectivity that you could maybe describe as adhesion to products of the human spirit. Yeah? I mean, adhesion to the sense that, so I have these file cards, and uh, I have a friend in Switzerland who likes them. Unfortunately, doesn't pay me for them, but he likes to collect them, René. And I just look at this file card, and even if I do not read it, or even if I couldn't read my own handwriting, as it happens quite often, I'm focused on that. And in the moment I'm focused on that, there is no separability. Now, different from, so, okay, this is the object, the, the, the concept of objectivity based on perception that I try to launch here. And, and I think uh, in the, the, the end of the loop with Marcos, there was an interesting perspective on how that maybe had an opening, not for the future of the humanities, but, but a, practical, a practical opening in the academic context first, but that's our context. Um, I am, uh, and this is still for your first answer, <laughs> I mean this internal spinning it then off the Latour way, and yes, it's inseparable, but at the same time interactive, I've, I've gotten kind of bored of that at this point. Yeah, of course, yes, but I mean, tell me something new, right? I mean, so this kind of objectivity that that is just this physical relationship and in my case of my own work Marcus that would be a different not a different but a, a, a more intense concept of presence yeah? in that sense I think the things that Schwind does with classics and so is interesting not what he says about it but what he really does how he reads this text that could be a development now um, what you're saying about praxeology and um, looking um, at texts, for example, or at artworks from the producer's side is very fascinating in that context. I've never done it, but it was implied in one remark I made when I was talking about the powers of philology. When I was saying, I believe from my own memory, uh, when you edit a text in a philological way, I mean, you don't say that because that's not objective. Or I mean, the old-fashioned way objective. You cannot help feeling that you produced it. Physically, yeah? I mean, in medieval text, you cannot help imagining that you were the one who was writing, which was physically very difficult, on that parchment with, an, with a feather and with ink, etc., etc. That's what I meant. I've never done this myself, but I think for the question of this objectivity in the sense of an adhesion, conceptual adhesion to an object, uh, to go to the creator's side, not only the author's side, could be a very, very decisive move, which I've never done, but I hope you will continue pursuing. Yes. Well, thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, we had on um, uh, Monday, I think, a discussion between Marcus and Paul. Um, I think what came out of that are two different ways of understanding uh, objectivity in humanities. So Marcus's proposal was, quote unquote, humanist in the strict sense that Humanities deal with images that humans make themselves. Sure, and that's what's mm -hmm. And then Paul objected, no, that's the form, right? We have to consider history. Um, we have to sort of give this more flesh by recognizing some internal dynamics. Um, I'm summarizing the, the interesting thing is for you, Marcus, the objectivity comes out of the fact that it's tied back to some notion of the human. Yes. And it's is life support. For you, the objectivity comes from saying the embeddedness in the past. And for you, I have the experience, the idea that it's actually linked to the future rather than the past. So the, the comment you made about um, you know, the fantasy of leaving the planet, uh, Jeff Bezos' fantasy, the comment you made was, well, we should shape that fantasy rather than dismiss it as an illusion. And I found that a very interesting idea. Idea. And I wonder if you would be okay with me characterizing your idea of objectivity as, say, transformative in that sense, as opening up that mass of what we have from the past towards uh, sort of future questions. Okay, I mean, many thanks. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it this way. I mean, let me just insist that for today, 
uh, the concept of objectivity, not against Marcus's concept, that I was emphasizing was very much in the sense that Paul had understood it. I mean, in, in, a, in a way, in the sense of immanente interpretation, I mean, in the German context, there would be some, somewhat like Steiger in the 1950s, or in the sense of new, of new criticism, just the focus not only on text, but on creations of the human spirit, the physical focus. I mean, I was emphasizing more the non-interpretative side. This kind of, I mean, again, you know, we sit around here, if we all had a printout of, of Wanderers Nachtlied, for example, we would all concentrate on it in this moment, that would already create a focus. That was the type of objectivity that I was emphasizing. Now, um, what you're saying about... No, 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 no. I mean, I just wanted to emphasize that was my intention. Now, if you see the final part of what I'd say as future-oriented, um, let me go very existential. Yeah? I mean, you know, I'm 73. I mean, I've, I want to. I want to be around for a certain while. I mean, I just got a brand new granddaughter, and uh, by the time she chooses what college she may go to, I'll be 92. So I just pushed it. I always say with 90, when I need a walker and stuff, I want to disappear. But now it's 92. So I mean, I want to stay around. But at the same time, at the same time. Um, you know, my concerns are not like what's going to happen in 50 years existentially. No. I think of my grandchildren. That's why I, I, I brought them in. And in that sense, what you're saying about this investment, and again, individual investment, to have some ideas within the humanities of what could be a common focus, what could make their existence individually better. I mean, I'm not much into, into classical music, but yes, I mean, listening to an entire symphony, I mean, which is an attention span that people don't have today anymore. Yeah? Doing that, for example, concentrating on a Michelangelo painting, etc., that would be something, and, and I like what you did with my idea of the hermeneutic explosion, not to necessarily say, oh, you know, humans will not depart from the planet, but, but for example, to think about that in a context of redemption, of fulfillment, yeah? I mean, uh, not in the sense that this will be the binding interpretation, but in the sense of using this explosive side of ideas that we can still, with our imagination, produce when we read classical text, whatever classic exactly means, to use that, to use that in the future. And in that sense, I mean, I love your idea that what I was saying had a future orientation. I like it a whole lot. In the sense that I think you were beginning to, to say what I was saying at the end, your generation should do. I mean, if that interests you, then you think about ways of, of processing that. Many, many thanks. Nick. Yeah, that's, I think, my, oh. it's more of a comment than a question. But so why we end on the commentary? That's yeah. nice to fill the margin. The comment is big world time. OK. Did I miss another hand? Um, yes. Yeah, me. Hello, Esther. Hi, um, Esther. Hi. Um, do you think that our uh, the 20s that we're in can be compared to the 1920s a little bit? Because your thought, uh, your talk, um, reminded me um, a little bit of um, Leo Beck that I'm focusing on, and uh, you know Einstein. Those those figures. They were very. Um, they're very difficult to, you know, uh, to you know. You could say, of course, Einstein was a physicist, but then he was also a philosopher, right? And uh, thinking of on time and space. And Arendt came here to save some idea of German um, multi-perspectivism. So maybe you could just comment on that. And my second question would be, what is your thought on how can you know interdisciplinary work be? Um, innovative and help us in the future to focus, but then also um, not to lose our, um, well. The, the okay, I start, I start with, yeah. the, with the second question, and many, many thanks. Um, see, I, I think one of those academic words that, that still have a high purchase, but that should be eliminated for 50 years or more is interdisciplinary. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you always get international interdisciplinary. Everything is international interdisciplinary, um, in which there's a whole generation, and maybe it's my generation, of people who are not the least disciplinary. If you ask what's their core competence, what are the texts that they have read? I mean, you give you an example. I mean, I come out of this very German tradition of romance philology, romanistic, yeah, and that meant that you 
I mean, whether you were speaking it well or not, but you could at least uh, know French, Spanish, Italian well, I mean, historically reading well, and that you kind of knew these three literatures and cultures, and if you wanted to get further, you would include Portuguese, Romanian, etc., etc. I mean, today, that doesn't exist anymore, really. Yeah? I mean, people know a little bit of South American. So, I mean, okay. In that sense, that is a consequence of this general interdisciplinary. You're always interdisciplinary. You always do what you're not supposed to do. So I think, and this is in the spirit of, uh, of what I was trying to say in the end, I mean, with this philology, I would actually say a redisciplinarization on the sense that there are certain things you know well. Yeah? I mean, you know, uh, if you know Spanish 17th century literature well, that's a lot to read and a lot of theology and fantastic texts. Yeah? Somebody who knows that well, like Karl Fossler knew that well, hardly exists anymore. This is not what I did, but I think this is in the moment. And you're always already in an interdisciplinary context. Today. You're always already in that. So I think a focus on something, in your case, maybe in the 1920s, that you, there's something you know really well. For young colleagues, I would say that's a question you should ask yourself, not only what's the profile that gets you a job, is there something that is the core of your competence, yeah? where without doing Wikipedia or whatever, you can't address certain questions. That is important. Um, now, to your real question, I will give you an alternative answer about the, what, I mean, it's about what do I think about the humanities today. Of course, as I'm retired now, the humanities have entered into a deep crisis, and uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that's a typical answer, so oh my god, it's, it's going to be horrible. What I really see is this, and this goes back, and maybe we go this way full circle, what I was saying at the very beginning of the talk about Marcus's and my polemics in the Neuzürcher Zeit, which I think was really nice. It's Point, counterpoint, precisely because you really hit back. This was, when I read the first paragraph, I almost got a heart attack, you know. Just, you know whatever is this grandiose misverständnis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, wow. Um, but uh, I still think that the humanities as an institution look at enrollments, look at, I mean, forgive me the word, but the shit that is normally taught, yeah? even at top institutions, and people repeat their seminars. Oh, I'm teaching introduction into literary theory for the 20th time. It gets better each time, as if it was a wine, right? I mean, laziness around. The humanities have a good chance to disappear. Yeah, I mean, they have a good chance to disappear as an institution like Stanford, where the humanities have grown to a very good level, but at the same time, I mean, Stanford can perfectly do like MIT without the humanities. Yeah, We used to have a president, that's an interesting quote, an eminent computer scientist, John Hennessy, who was once asked by the Wall Street Journal, if the humanities goes to zero enrollment, uh, would you still maintain the humanities? And he gave a beautiful answer. He said, yes, I would keep them. Why? Because it is the human humanities that make the university into an intellectual place, and this is what we all need. This is what makes engineering, but, but do we have such people? So there is a risk of the humanities to disappear. There's a risk also of the humanities, and that's an interesting dimension, to take place somewhere else. Yeah? If I read sometimes the, the, German, the German daily newspaper Feuilletons, I think they're oftentimes sharper than what happens within the humanities at the universities, not only if we have a polemic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that could all happen. I would say, and maybe that's a bottleneck situation, if the humanities as an institution manage to survive this situation, this precarious situation, I could imagine a glory age. And I could imagine a glory age with a different dimension of interdisciplinarity. I know, for example, um, that uh, my friend Marcus is trying hard and admire that these days to really become a specialist in physics, in present day physics. And this is tough. You have to got, get up earlier and you have to listen to equations and stuff that you have never done. But that type of interdisciplinarity, which is not interdisciplinarity, but this is a mind frame that, yes, is not the same like in the 1920s, but remindful of the 1920s. That is not only at Bonn, but also at Harvard, NYU, Stanford, New School, etc., etc., a possibility. And um, in, spite, in spite of being retired, I hope that this is the future of the humanities, but don't take it for granted. I think your generation should not take it for granted. That takes hard work, investment, risk, without the guarantee of it really 
becoming real. So, oh, we're done. Okay. Great. I'm getting signs from the watch in the back. So, thank you very much.